You are the father of a U.S. Olympian. How does that, how does that feel as a dad? It feels great. Um, I start thinking that in, you know, uh, that she actually is an Olympian. So, yeah, it, it feels really good. I mean, obviously you're not there uh, because, of, because of COVID. I assume you've been in contact with her. How's she doing? Um, she's been doing pretty well. We, we haven't talked to her uh, uh, personally because of the, of the time difference, but we have been texting her back and forth. And uh, yeah, she's, they, they just recently moved her to the Olympic Villa. So uh, we only talked to her through text. I know you're familiar with um, the positive test on the team. Um, there are lots of worries among athletes and their parents uh, and the Olympic officials about COVID. Are, are you worried at all? Yes, we, and we actually, I actually got a lot of texts when they, uh, somebody found out that there was somebody on the team was positive, but um, when we found out there was uh, an alternate, so we weren't too worried, but still, yeah, we are worried. My wife especially, she's really worried. Is Sunni vaccinated? Yes. We're, uh, uh, the whole family's vaccinated except for the little one. And uh, Sunisa's vaccinated. She, uh, I know that before she left, she had to do like COVID tests every other day. So I'm, I'm pretty sure she's okay right now, but never know. Before she left for the games, what, what did you tell her? What kind of advice did you give her? Well, I, I told her that um, now, you know, her dream that making the Olympic was hard, but now she is actually in the Olympics. So, you know, she needs to go compete for her herself. You know, she's already made, uh, she already proved to the, the community, her family, her friends, and her coach that she is capable of getting there. So now it's time for her to go and uh, do it for herself. John, how did Suni discover gymnastics? Well, when Suni was a little kid, she, um, she's really hyper. She jumps around all the time. She uh, was able to do like the bridge and she you know, just liked to uh, jump around doing the backflip and stuff like that. So we brought her into the gym because one of um, my wife's friend is the coach, the coach at Midwest. And we brought it in just for like a little trial. And they uh, thought that she was good enough to be on a team. So they put her on a team and that first year, and then, uh, then she trained over the summer and competed level four the, the following year. And she won state, so. How old was she then? She, we brought in at six, at level, uh, at age six. And then uh, she started competing at age seven. When did you realize she was a special gymnast? Well, after the first, you know, the, the first year when she competed, she won state. And then the second year, they, they jumped her three levels. And then after that, they put her on this, the HOPES program, which is the beginning of the elite level. And that's when I thought that, okay, well, she might have potential to be in the Olympics. So, you know, we just continue pushing her, helping her, supporting her. Were you gymnastically inclined? I don't even think that's a word, but, <laughs> but we'll pretend it is. Well, um, my wife, she, she plays sports when she was younger. I play a lot of sports. I'm very competitive when it comes to sports. And uh, I do do a lot of uh, backflips and stuff like that. I, when I was younger, I used to do flips off the wall, off the ceiling, things like that. But I think, I think her gymnastic uh, skills, I think that's from my wife's side, but, she, but the competitive uh, side is probably from me. I understand that when she was sort of starting out, that her dad was so committed to her success that he actually built a beam in the backyard. Is that true? Yes, it is, and it's still here. Remember that being my bill for you? Yes. Why'd you do that? Uh, well, the thing is, 
you know, she don't have a beam. You know, she goes to the gym and she practice, but we don't have a beam here, so. Go! I couldn't afford a real beam, so I built the one out of, you know, a, a four by four. Six feet long. And covered it with the air mattress, you know, wrap. Why have you kept it all these years? I don't know. It just, uh, you know, she don't use it anymore, but it's just sitting in the backyard and then just never, I never, never threw it away. I understand that, um, that Suni is, is making history in Tokyo. She is the first Hmong U.S. Olympian. How, how proud does that make you? Yeah, she, she will be the first Hmong American to, to be in the Olympic. So, yeah, I am proud. The family's proud. All the community is very proud of her. So, I don't know. We, it, you know, it's almost like it's unreal, you know, because yeah, especially in gymnastic where, you know, you got the whole country going for this uh, a spot on the team, and you know, there's only four spot available. So if she made it, and that's pretty tough, and it makes us proud. I'm very proud of her. How are you going to watch the games since you can't be there in person? What are, what are you going to do? We are planning to have a watch party at my brother's house. Um, they volunteered the house for us to watch. We actually, want, at first we wanted to do a, like a community watch party, but since the time difference and you know, all the games are gonna be really early in the morning, I don't think that's possible. So we are gonna go to my brother's house and watch the game with, with the family. John, do, do you still get nervous? Do you get nervous watching SUNY even after all these years? Yes. I do get nervous, but I don't show it. Um, I know my wife gets nervous and I, I could see that and I try not to show it, but I do. In, deep inside me, I do get a little nervous, especially when she does the beam, because that's, that's uh, you know, that platform is very narrow and it's, uh, it, it's high, so I do get a little nervous. But she's been doing it for so many years now. I mean, how, how can you still get nervous? Everybody gets nervous when a kid gets up, up, up on, the, on those uh, events. Especially you, you want to make her, you want to see her do well. You don't want her to make any mistakes. And then, of course, you, you get a little nervous. Double fall. But once they're done, then you, you get relieved. I'm rolling up my sleeves for science, so I'll survive if I contract this virus. For family dinners, family vacations, family anything. For traveling somewhere beyond my living room. And for the Rebels, there is no greater feeling than being in the stadium and cheering on Ole Miss. And now it's your turn. Roll up your sleeves, America. Plan your vaccine, because every shot counts. Visit planyourvaccine.com and make your plan. What should we watch for to find out whether this Geneva summit was worth it? What would it take for you to support this bipartisan infrastructure deal? What are the issues that the party stands for? That seems to be the missing piece here. If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. Sometimes the news can be difficult and overwhelming for kids to understand. The coronavirus come back next year. So to help make sense of it all, we've created a newscast just for them. Man, you know a lot. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. I'm rolling up my sleeves for science, so I'll survive if I contract this virus. For family dinners, family vacations, family anything. For traveling somewhere beyond my living room. And for the Rebels, there is no greater feeling than being in the stadium and cheering on Ole Miss. And now it's your turn. Roll up your sleeves, America. Plan your vaccine, because every shot counts. Visit planyourvaccine.com and make your plan. Your daughter has called you her, her biggest cheerleader. I have read and heard uh, that she draws inspiration from dad. Why do you think that is? Well, 
grow, uh, her journey to the Olympic, I was always with her most of the time because of my other kids at home. And so my wife had to stay home with her. So I m m traveled with her to all her meets, all her competitions. And, you know, we joke around a lot. And every time she go compete, I always, tell, I always talk to her and say, hey, you know, don't worry about it. You know, or just have fun, things like that. Cause she's always get nervous, and she always tell me that, "Ooh, this girl is so good. She's so she don't think that she's gonna do better than her." But I always have to tell her that it's okay. You always you all, you will do better, and then you know when she come out on top, you know she's happy. So, how do you think that your accident inspires her? Um. When I got hurt, I didn't think that she would actually, um, she wasn't going to go because she and her coach came to the hospital, met me. And uh, when I told them to just go ahead, go because she worked so hard for her. So when she left, I didn't expect her to uh, feel that she had to do it for me. But then she did, and she said she she. She, uh, she know that my accident, my, my accident is worse than her uh, win or losing a, on a team. So she did it for me. That's what she said, and I think that. And since then, she just continued to want to do it for me. So I'm proud of that. I'm happy that she competed for me. Let's talk about the accident for just a moment, John. Uh, can you take me back? To that day, what happened? Well, uh, it was a Sunday, and um, uh, me and a bunch of my friend, we just got done playing golf, and we went to a friend's house to uh, to help him trim a tree down, so then uh, he could set up a tent for his daughter's wedding the following week, and you know because it was a simple trim, I didn't expect. To you know, I didn't. I wasn't. I was careless, pretty much. I, we, I was up in a tree, trimmed the tree, and when it broke, it it whiplashed and hit me, and I fell off the ladder, and head first. So that um, that caused that. Then I went to the hospital and got got. That's how I got hurt. What's been the hardest part of of the of the injury? The hardest part about the injury is that, you know, because of it's a spinal injury, you know, the hardest part is that I, I can't utilize my anything be holding below my chest. Um, it, I'm paralyzed from chest down. So um, that and also the fact that I'm always so outgoing. I'm, I've been, you know, I fix a lot of things around the house and thing, cars, things like that. So. Things that I can't do, I know how to do it, but I can't do physically. That is the hardest part, and I get frustrated sometimes. But you know, I gotta learn how to cope with all that. How's the rehab going? Rehab's been um, going pretty good. My my upper body, I could do a lot of stuff with it. You know, my hands are getting stronger. Um, my balance is not so great, but I. I'm learning how to cope with that. Um, I volunteer for a program called E-Stand, where they inserted a, st uh, a stimulator in my back, and when I turned the, the the machine on, I could actually move my legs a little bit. Wow. D do you think that, that you'll walk again? I don't know. With the technology that we have right now, I hope so. If not, Anything, if I could stand up or just move a few feet, I would be happy. But um, I'm hoping that um, with the East stand and also, you know, the with all the technology, maybe someday I will be able to walk. That's my hope. So you'll, you'll watch your daughter compete at the Olympics in Tokyo. And as you're watching her, what will you be thinking? 
as I watch her, I'll be thinking if she bring home a couple of medals, and hopefully a couple of gold, I mean, that would be so great for the family, the community, and for the USA. Yeah. I mean, do, do you think this she'll compete again after this, or do you think this will be her first and her last? Well, I talked to her before she left, and she really wanted to do college gymnastics. So I'm hoping that she, you know, after the Olympic, you know, she only got three more years before the next Olympic. I was hoping that she continue on, but but as far as I know, she wants to do college gymnastics. She wants to go to college and compete. So it's up to her. You're you're not going to be there because of the virus. Um, I assure you, your daughter is going to watch this interview on the Today Show. What do you want to say to her? What do you want her to know? Well, one thing for sure, I I want Tanisa to know that. I'm proud of her no matter what happened. Um, I'm behind her, her, her family's behind her, the community's behind her, her fans behind her, and the United States behind her. So whatever she does, we are all proud of her. Just go out there, have fun. John, what's the secret? How do, how do, you, how do you rear a daughter to become a U.S. Olympian? I don't think there's really a secret. I mean. I talk to her, I motivate her, and I, I, I tell her to do good and just, just follow her heart, have fun. But the real secret is, I think it's her. I think she's pretty natural so in, in this uh, sport. So it's all her, most of it is her. Good morning, welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. right. We are going to be cheering you on all the way. Hoda is going to renew their vows right here. Yes. Cheers to you. Cheers. To the expression, eyes and shine. Good morning. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. right. Yes. We are going to be cheering you on all the way. Hoda is going to renew their vows right here. Yes. Cheers to you. Cheers. Cheers. We've been watching Chanel bust a move all morning. New meaning to the expression, eyes and shine. Jenna, nearly two miles in the air. This is amazing! Yes. Yes. Your Gampy would be so proud. Oh, thank you, Al. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. What should we watch for to find out whether this Geneva summit was worth it? What would it take for you to support this bipartisan infrastructure deal? What are the issues that the party stands for? That seems to be the missing piece here. If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. The Meet the Press Chuck Todd cast, free wherever you get your podcasts. Somebody said to me, check out TikTok. I'm like, I am 44 years old. I am not gonna roll up on TikTok to mess with these kids. All right, so what was everybody's favorite and least favorite part of the day? Meet Jose Rolone, a Brooklyn-based wedding planner and single dad of three who goes by the username NYC Gay Dad in viral videos on TikTok and Instagram. You're making me clean again? <sighs> Don't make me destroy you. Parenting three kids during the pandemic gave him the creative spark that pushed him to the platform. 
LGBTQ rights have been going on for quite some time. But I do think in the parenting space, we really sort of still are at the forefront of that. This was a platform to be able to highlight LGBTQ plus family here that is doing the same things that you do. Was there a conscious decision to, to try and use it to break down barriers and, and shatter myths and preconceived ideas about what fatherhood is? You know, I grew up with a father who was all about like machismo and, you know, you couldn't talk about your feelings. And so I think one of the things I wanted to highlight too on social media is as a man, you can be vulnerable. Growing up, Jose always dreamed of one day becoming the kind of dad that he wished he'd had. You had this killer smile, beautiful eyes. After marrying his husband, Tim Merrill, in 2010, it seemed like he was one step closer to making that dream a reality. When and how did you decide that uh, you were ready to be parents? When Tim and I met, I think he revealed to me on the third date that he did not want to have children. And I was like, oh man, we're in trouble here, right? Because I knew that I always wanted to have kids. But something happened right after we got married and we were outside of a coffee shop. And he said to me, so I want you to know that I've been open to being open to having children. I lost it. Through surrogacy, the pair welcomed their son Avery into the world in March of 2013. Tim ended up being this really incredible father. So when we hit two months, he was walking out of the room and was holding Avery in his arms. And he's like, babe, I think we should have more children. I was like, what? And we went for it. The unexpected happened. Their surrogate became pregnant with twins. But 11 weeks into the pregnancy, while his husband Tim was on a trip in Pennsylvania, Jose got a phone call that would change everything. And I got a call uh, from the Pennsylvania uh, Police Department. I get on the phone and uh, the detective told me that he had passed away uh, the night before. Uh, and it was a heart attack uh, in his sleep. There was so much running through my head, just not only having in that moment dealing with the grieving and feeling numb, but my mind also went to, we're 11 weeks pregnant. My son just lost his father. What if something were to happen to me? I didn't want to leave him alone in this world. So I made a decision in that moment to not only follow through the pregnancy, uh, but I actually announced that we were pregnant while giving my husband's eulogy at a church in front of three, 400 people. Here we are, seven years later. Now my son is eight, my girls will be seven next week. I mean, do you ever take a step back and you look at your life and you think, sweet God, what am I doing? Three children, single dad. Yeah, look, this ride has been wild. And I think we all go through phases of grieving. Nothing is permanent. I'm aware that this can shift like that. So for me, it's really vital that I stay in this moment and I appreciate it and I'm grateful and I keep moving forward with my kids in the best way that I can so that when those moments come where s stuff goes down, hopefully I'll be ready. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. bright. Are you ready? We're going to do our part to spread the word on the importance of vaccines. So crucial for reopening America. A big day around here. A very special naturalization ceremony. Many of them doctors, nurses, other essential workers. If you are a nurse, thank you. Spring has sprung, guys, and we want to fill this season with some fun and surprises. Yes. This is the face of excitement. <laughs> right. Celebrating Earth Day. Let's change the world. Love it. The Meet the Press Chuck Todd cast, free wherever you get your podcasts. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Keep going, keep going. Block the shot. 
years ago I used to say, forget about the ponytail and look at them as wrestlers because there's going to be a point where the ponytail is not going to matter. And we're at that point. Team Alpha is an all-girls wrestling club started five seasons ago. We started out with approximately nine girls, since have grown to over 50. An alpha wolf doesn't necessarily have to be an alpha male, right? Female wolf can be the alpha, the leader of the pack. You know, we're not quite leaders just yet on the national scene, but we're getting there. Participation in girls wrestling has seen a 500% increase since 2001 and is currently sanctioned as a high school sport in 21 states. Team Alpha's home state of New York isn't yet one of these, so girls either wrestle on the boys' team or compete in clubs outside of school. I have uh, two daughters, Kendall, who is 13. She's been wrestling just over three years, and McKenna, who is 10, and she's been wrestling a little over five, and she was probably around two or three. And my wife and I noticed that the only time she ever sat still was when she was either watching wrestling on TV with me or at tournaments. After watching one of those wrestling tournaments as a four-year-old, McKenna told her dad something that would change everything. And I was like, Dad, I want to start wrestling. And then I started wrestling on the boys' team at first, and then Dad made a girls' team. What do you like about wrestling? Since I'm wrestling, I feel like I'm tougher. When you were wrestling with the boys, did you enjoy that? Yeah, it's fun. When you wrestle them, it's not that intense as it is wrestling a girl. Why is that? Because boys um, aren't that tough. I would probably do better if I wrestled boys, but I kind of like wrestling girls better because girls don't sweat as much as the boys do when we're wrestling. As a boy, I'll pretend not to be offended. Okay. The girls of Team Alpha range in age from kindergarten to 12th grade, but they all see themselves as part of the same movement. I feel like it's like partially like a women's rights movement in a way because we're trying to get like a male dominant sport to also be like our sport. I've had coaches say girls shouldn't be wrestling, like just, you know, we all hear it, but I kind of block it out or just take it as like motivation to just push myself. Some of the kids in my class, I'm like, call me a tomboy, but I'd rather be a tomboy than a girly girl, so I like it better than that. I know it's 2020, but you know that there are still some people who think girls shouldn't be wrestling. Yeah. It's, it's not a sport for girls. What, what would you say to them? Um, I would say girls can do anything boys can. We just brush it off until they sanction girls wrestling here in New York, then we'll do what we gotta do to get the girls on the mat that wanna be on the mat. Coach Ken started wrestling in third grade, encouraged by his dad, a former high school wrestler who would work double shifts to support their family. Long days on the job prevented him from attending Ken's wrestling matches. You know, I ran around most of my teens, you know, mad, angry. Why doesn't my dad get to come to all my stuff like some of the other kids? When I started coaching my kids and when they started to get older, I swore I'd never miss anything. So that's what I base everything around. I have to be there. 12, 13, 14. Ready? When I'm on the mat and I hear my dad on the side, I know that he loves me and he wants to get me like more into the sport. It's the best feeling a kid could ever have. He says, be a leader, not a follower. And I always listen to that. The first step's always the hardest in this sport. Once you take that first step, at the very least, you're gonna learn a work ethic that sticks with you forever. There's nothing wrong with being tough. You know, there's nothing wrong with being gritty. That's what gets it done on the mat. That's what gets it done in life. Before the girls came along, is, is this where you thought you'd be? Never. It's pretty cool though. It's awesome. You know, I got two blood daughters and 50 more in the club. Alpha! We are! Alpha! Four, five, six! Family!
snow today all day. Summer's almost here. And if you're looking for the perfect way to welcome warmer weather, my pal Anthony Contrino is sharing his favorite al fresco meal. Not al roca, but al fresco. We're talking juicy pork milanese, peppery arugula salad, an easy anti-pasti, along with Uncle Pasti, with olives, and of course, a classic Italian cocktail to wash it all down. Mmm. Summer is just around the corner. It's not one of my favorite seasons, but my birthday's in there, so I'll allow it. Anyway, it is gonna be really nice to be able to dine outside with friends. So today I am whipping up the perfect al fresco meal. I'll be making delicious orange rosemary marinated olives, the juiciest, crispiest pork milanese that you've ever had, topped with a nice fresh salad. And then of course we need a cocktail or two. I'll be making a Negroni and an Americano. Oh, hi, I didn't see you there. Welcome to the new set of Saucy. Let's get cooking. I'm gonna be making some delicious orange rosemary marinated olives. We love olives in my family. We have them out for every holiday as part of an antipasti. I'm gonna be using orange and rosemary because those are two flavors that I like and that work really well together. So first things first, I have two different kinds of olives. My favorite, Caltavetrano, which are super buttery, and then a little bit more of a pungent flavor with Kalamata olives. I like the two to balance off each other and they're really pretty when mixed up together later on. For the marinade itself, we'll start by adding some oil, it's about a third of a cup. You can eyeball this into a small saucepan. So first things first, an orange. Any sweet orange will do. This is a plain navel orange, and I'm just cutting a few strips off. Then I like to go back with a knife and carefully, don't hurt yourself here, similar to like filleting fish, Remove the bitter pith. We don't need any bitter flavor in our marinade over here. So you can see all the white part is gone and you're left with just the beautiful, super fragrant skin. Right into the pot that goes. Take your time. Better off being safe than sorry with this. and the last one into the pot. Don't want this orange to go to waste. So I'm gonna take that sweet, delicious juice and we'll add that to the pot as well. That'll add a little bit of sweetness to our olives. Next up, garlic. Why, why does this happen every time? Six takes later. I'm gonna grab two cloves. You can buy them peeled already, which will save on the aggravation. Okay, so just thin slice, eighth of an inch, even thinner if you can, without hurting yourself, into our pot. Then let's add some more flavor. A bay leaf. I'm gonna add a pinch of red pepper flakes. I'm not a big spice person, so I literally just add a tiny little pinch. Last but not least, some fresh rosemary. So I'm gonna cut off a couple of sprigs here and pull off about half of the leaves or just kind of break them. I just like the way it looks when it's in there. It's still gonna permeate that oil. So I'm literally just waiting for the edges to just sort of start to simmer as I'm doing this. It'll go pretty quickly. We're not looking to cook, we're looking to infuse. You'll know it's done when it gets nice and fragrant. Similar when you add garlic and onion to like a saute pan and it's getting there, it's smelling really good already. So you can see it's starting to simmer a little bit. So I'm gonna cut the heat and then simply just pour it right on top of our olives. Make sure you get all of this flavor. Leave no speck of garlic or rosemary behind. Okay, now I'm gonna let this sit out at room temperature for a couple of hours. So every now and then, every time you pass it, just pick it up, 
give it a toasty turn, zhuzh it up, get those olives coated nice with that oil to help marinate it, and give those olives some time to steep. Talent and perseverance, inspiring America. I've been preparing for a moment like this for my whole life. I have lots of songs and lots of stuff to share. I want to show my daughter what it's like to overcome adversity. So many reasons to cheer for that young lady. NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. It has been a long year. Yeah, where it's been anything but normal. Well, now there's hope, the COVID vaccines. I know, I know, it's been a little confusing. Like, really confusing. So it's more important than ever to make a plan. Visit planyourvaccine.com to find out where and when to get your vaccine. What are you waiting for? Roll up your sleeves and plan your vaccine. Plan your vaccine. Plan your vaccine. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. The Meet the Press Chuck Todd cast, free wherever you get your podcasts. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. If there's one thing that I can eat for dinner every night, it's pork milanese, or any milanese, chicken, anything, pound it thin, fry it crispy, I'm gonna eat it. I'd probably even enjoy shoe leather if it was fried. So right here I have, from my butcher, you can get these at most supermarkets, some nice, beautiful, thick pork loin chops that are boneless. I'm gonna pound them nice and thin so that every inch of this milanese is absurdly crispy. Get yourself a generous sized sheet of plastic wrap. And this is where the fun begins, guys. This may look a little scary, but I promise you it's not. We're going to butterfly these chops. So, gonna place a chop on the plastic wrap, taking a really sharp chef knife. I'm going to find the center, and I'm gonna cut it open like a book. Work slowly, deliberate, steady slices. And this is just to help get it nice and thin. And I'm just slowly going to start peeling it open. And there you go. If you skip this step and just start pounding, you're gonna be there all day and your meat's not gonna be as tender. So truly don't skip that step. Be sure to leave a little slack around so that our chop has room to grow. Get yourself one of these fun toys and go to town. Watch your fingers, don't do what I almost just did. There you have it. It's about a quarter of an inch thick and we have a gorgeous big cutlet now that is for one person. Just keep going. your kids or your boss piss you off today, this is the perfect meal to make at the end of the day. This one's even better. You can do this with chicken breast. I love it with chicken. You can do it with beef. If you don't have time to go to the gym, this is the perfect activity for you. This 
what it feels like to exercise. <laughs> One to go. That looks great. It's as easy as that. I am going to wipe down, sanitize, clean my hands, and then we're going to dredge these guys up. Okay, now that that's set up, let's start getting these bad boys breaded. So, free them from the plastic wrap. Look how great that looks. Nice and thin. And when cooking, you wanna make sure you're seasoning in layers. You never wanna just finish with salt because it's just sitting on top and doesn't have time to absorb. Also, when cooking, you want to do all of one action at once. It keeps things neater, it's quicker. This is the bulk of the seasoning, so don't be cheap. And get both sides. The last one's always the annoying one, isn't it? Perfect. Now to begin breading. You may notice that there's something here missing, flour. Growing up, whenever my dad made chicken cutlets or milanese, he never used flour. And when I went to culinary school, I was like, "Where? What, what's with the flour? And I've tested it both ways. In this case, it is an extra ingredient, an extra step, and I find it to be completely unnecessary. It actually coats better to this pork if you don't use flour. So while you're probably thinking, I don't know what I'm talking about, I would curse here, but I'm not allowed to anymore. I definitely do. So this is my dredging station. Three very well beaten eggs and two cups of seasoned breadcrumb. Another trick, wet hand, dry hand. So in she goes. Make sure we're nice and well coated. You can see how great a pie dish works for this. It fits well, it has a flat enough surface and it has sides to keep everything in place. Give it a couple of shakes and right into our breadcrumb. Now, use your dry hand to start covering it with the breadcrumb. When you get to this point, you can flip it. Make sure you don't miss a millimeter of breadcrumb. Every crevice, breadcrumb and press it in. We want these to be well coated and super duper crispy. Just like that. And that's ready to be fried. Make sure you press it on, lock it in there. Isn't that cool? This is kind of a fun thing to get the kids involved in too. Put them to work. Dinner was not for free at my house growing up. Thank God I did most of the cooking. My mom's cooking's atrocious. That's a big one. Time to fry them up. I've added about a quarter of an inch of vegetable oil to a pot. When frying, I like to use a neutral oil like safflower, canola, any vegetable oil, because it won't take on any flavor. Have this going over medium high heat. And I know it's ready when I add a pinch of breadcrumb and we get some sizzle action. So you see how it foamed up and it already started darkening? Time to add one of our cutlets. Mm. 
We're gonna let this fry for about two to three minutes per side until it's deep, golden, gorgeous brown. Keep an eye on the edges of your cutlet. I can see it already starting to get nice and golden brown in that little nook, which means it's almost ready to flip. I'm gonna take a sneak peek. Almost there. For me, any cutlet should be on the brink of being burnt for it to be delicious. Now just another couple of minutes. Transfer it to a wire rack. If you put it on paper towels, it's gonna get a little soggy and the breading is gonna start to fall off. Get another one in really quick. And then while it's still hot, add a nice generous amount of a flaky sea salt. You can see it melting into that hot oil. Some of it won't melt. It'll add a little bit of an extra crunch and extra seasoning. These cutlets are gonna cook really quickly, so keep an eye on the pan. This is not the time to walk away and start another project. Oh my God. extra crispy for the chef. I have my oven set to the lowest setting. I'm gonna throw these in there to keep them warm. I don't wanna keep them in there too long though, just long enough to make a delicious salad. Our week-long journey begins here in Orlando, Louisville, Kentucky. In Cleveland. Our Across America journey, reporting on an America rebuilding and reimagining a future after the pandemic. Good evening tonight from Geneva, just hours away from his historic summit. Over 16,000 unaccompanied children tonight in custody. What's victory look like in this, or what does improvement look like? It's going to be a challenge to meet that 70% goal. Why is it so challenging? NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. It has been a long year. Yeah, where it's been anything but normal. Well, now there's hope, the COVID vaccines. I know, I know, it's been a little confusing. Like really confusing. So it's more important than ever to make a plan. Visit planyourvaccine.com to find out where and when to get your vaccine. What are you waiting for? Roll up your sleeves and plan your vaccine. Plan your vaccine. Plan your vaccine. This peppery arugula is the base of my salad, but any good salad needs a killer dressing, and this is mine, my white balsamic dressing. Going to start by adding a couple of tablespoons of just plain old clover honey. This bougie thing looks like a lot of fun, but it's a little messy. This is gonna add just enough sweetness, some Dijon, which is gonna add more depth of flavor. It's also going to help emulsify this dressing when we add the oil. 
get that all in there. A little bit of salt, about a half a teaspoon, and then about an eighth of a teaspoon of freshly cracked black pepper. I'm gonna whisk this to combine. Make sure you get that honey to dissolve. That looks beautiful. Now that the base of our dressing's ready, I'm going to drizzle in olive oil. Very slowly begin to drizzle in your olive oil, giving it time to break up the fat molecules and emulsify. If you can see the oil puddling in the vinegar, that means you're adding too much and it's going to not emulsify properly. I did not sign up for this much cardio today. You can see it already starting to thicken. That means that we have a great emulsification. It's a beautiful dressing. Great golden color from the white balsamic and this really good Sicilian olive oil. Mm, gorgeous, gorgeous. Mm, it's perfect, it doesn't need any more seasoning. This is a very simple salad. All I'm going to add to this arugula are some beautiful cherry tomatoes that I'm just gonna have. If you don't have a small utility knife like this, a nice serrated knife, it's a really great kitchen tool. I use it a lot. I'm gonna give this a quick toss. And then add your dressing to taste. This makes more than you need for this, but it stores really well in the fridge, in a mason jar or just any sealed container for at least a week. Mm. So all set. All that's left to do is to put the two pieces of the puzzle together. Mm. It smells so good. Okay. These are nice and warm. Let's go with this big guy. Just throw that right onto a plate and then don't be cheap. Oh, yes. Yes, 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 yes. Then because God forbid I cook something and not put cheese on it. How delicious does this look? I cannot wait to dig in. I'm kind of thirsty. I think I need to make a cocktail. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. to today. Future's looking yeah. We are going to be cheering you on all the way. Hoda is going to renew their vows right yes. here. Cheers to you. Cheers. the expression, rise and shine. Tonight we're on the scene as the urgent search for survivors is underway after the deadly collapse of a high-rise building. Buildings don't fall down in America like this. The Delta variant. What does this mean for people who are fully vaccinated? NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Our week-long journey begins here in Orlando, Louisville, Kentucky. In Cleveland. Our Across America journey reporting on an America rebuilding and reimagining a future after the pandemic. Good evening tonight from Geneva, just hours away from his historic summit. Over 16,000 unaccompanied children tonight in custody. What's victory look like in this? Or what does improvement look like? It's going to be a challenge to meet that 70% goal. Why is it so challenging? NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. The Meet the Press Chuck Todd cast. Free wherever you get your podcasts.
I'm going to show you how to make probably the most quintessential Italian aperitivo, which is a pre-meal drink, something meant to whet your appetite. And this bitter campari is going to do just that. That is one of the three major components in this Negroni. This drink is equal parts campari, sweet vermouth, and gin, and it is going to punch you in the face. So I'm doing an ounce and a quarter each of these three spirits. This is our sweet vermouth to balance that bitterness just the slightest bit. And we can't forget about the gin. This is a London dry gin that I'm using. Then some blood orange. I like to peel it directly into my beaker to catch any oils that come out. And I'm just going to peel off a nice healthy strip. Add some ice. We wanna get this nice and chilled. It's also gonna dilute this the slightest bit. And stir, stir, stir. At least 20 seconds. Really let those flavors combine and let it chill throughout. Perfect. Get yourself some bougie ice. Mmm. So pretty. Then, every cocktail needs a garnish. Another strip of our blood orange skin. Give it a little twist. And then I kind of like to run it on the rim just to get those oils on there. Little extra hint and punch of the orange. Now, if you feel like this is a little too bitter for your palate, we're gonna make its less aggressive cousin, the Americano, which is pretty similar. We're gonna start the same way with our compati, using an ounce and a half this time. And then the sweet vermouth. No gin in this one. So it's not gonna be quite as boozy. Perfect. Same thing. And stir, stir, stir. More bougie ice. <laughs> Isn't that such a beautiful color? Then, finally, we'll top it off with club soda. How beautiful that effervescence. Let's get about our little garnish. Our little straw. There you have it, the perfect Negroni and Americano. Can't wait to share these with my friends. Is a pretty color. And a little twist. Thank you. You stir. I like dilutes it a little. Welcome. This looks delicious. Beautiful. Some pork milanese. Nice. Thank you, Anthony. You're welcome.
jewels from women's magazines. I can't make a move without consulting Family Circle or Harper's Bazaar. <laughs> Otherwise, I'd have no idea what shade of red drives a man crazy. <laughs> Little hint, it's the one with the least amount of fabric involved. That is part of a stand-up set from Midge Maisel, played by Rachel Brosnahan in the hit Amazon Prime series, The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel. Brosnahan's performance in that role has earned the 30-year-old an Emmy Award and two Golden Globes for Best Actress in a Comedy. Born in Milwaukee and raised outside of Chicago, Brosnahan's professional life has been rooted in New York City, which serves as the setting for Mrs. Maisel. Rachel and I got together on a recent snowy day in New York for a safely distanced Sunday sit-down and something new for a pair of New Yorkers, a sightseeing tour through the city on a double-decker bus. I'm so excited. You got room for two more? <laughs> All right. I feel like we're in a movie. Is it snowing? <gasps> How oh romantic. Gosh, this is magical. Wow. 13 years after moving here, Rachel Brosnahan still marvels at New York City. You sort of give off New York. Do you feel like you're a New Yorker? Thank you. My understanding is that the mark from New Yorkers is 10 years, but not one day sooner. <laughs> <laughs> this is my tour of New York's Upper West Side. Cafe Lala with the big scaffolding. Oh Boy, we got here fast, didn't we? Yep. Got the it's you've that got very mail energy. Hardcore you've yeah. got mail energy. Yeah. Like, that's what I dreamed New York was like. You know, right. sitting by windows, drinking right. coffee and right. looking out on the Upper West Side. Yeah. Most of New York, it turns out, isn't like that, but <laughs> it's a little harder to live here than they tell you about in the movies. Or on television. The New York of the 1950s glitters in the marvelous Mrs. Maisel the Emmy-winning Amazon series starring Brosnahan as a down-and-out housewife who finds a funny way of landing on her feet. She's 21 and dumb as a Brillo pad, and, and I'm not naive. I know that men like stupid girls, right? Uh, but providing a colorful antidote to these gloomy times. Right before we sat down, we literally had the tape measure yeah. out, so we could have seven full feet between us. Seven, right I mean, overachieving, I appreciate that. Yeah, we, for you, we added the extra foot. Thanks, pal. Is it gratifying in some way to know how many people have been watching The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel during this time? Yeah, it's been so nice to hear that it made people laugh. The character at the center is someone who leads with hope and joy. I'm grateful to have been able to be a part of something that helps people escape for a minute. Something happened tonight. You'll work out with Cal where you're gonna go. Who the hell is Cal? Where is Eddie? Now, Brosnahan is escaping into a different, darker era, the 1970s, for the new Amazon crime thriller, I'm Your Woman. She plays Jean, a woman on the run, after her husband betrays his partners in crime. Is anybody looking? Everyone's looking, and they're looking for you, too. It is Brosnahan's first starring role in a film, and her first time as a producer under her company, Scrap Paper Pictures. Jean is an ordinary woman of the 70s who's been thrust into these extraordinary circumstances, and I'm grateful that a woman like Jean has been centered in this genre that's so traditionally male-dominated. And that's our director, Julia Hart. I like the way Julia described it. She said, I wanted to know what happened to Diane Keaton mm -hmm. in The Godfather once the door closed. Yep. This is a woman who lives primarily in silence. I felt like I didn't understand her when I first read the script. And for me, that's always the most important marker when choosing to take on a new part is that I, I don't get it. Yeah, but that's such an interesting way to put it. For you, some of that mystery is, is appealing in a character? Yeah, it feels like it's an exercise in empathy and, and, and a constant challenge, and it's always scary, and, and that's the dream. That dream took shape in New York, where Brosnahan, a born and bred Midwesterner, went to college and never left. Right there. I lived on the Upper West for a while. I lived on, on 83rd, and we shoot the stage deli diner two couple blocks from where I used to live. Oh, really good. Do not make me cry at the stage deli. We were living in this tiny, tiny New York apartment and auditioning all the time and just crossing my fingers and hoping that someone would, would take a shot. You haven't even asked my name yet. 
I, I apologize. It, it's Rachel. The first big shot came in 2013 when Rachel won a recurring and Emmy-nominated role in the hit Netflix series House of Cards. Heels are killing me. I get it now. Why men rule the world? No high heels. But it was not until she stepped into Midge Maisel's shoes and dresses and hats a few years later that Brosnahan became a household name. Comedy is fueled by abandonment and humiliation. Now, who the hell does that describe more than women? Season four of The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel starts production in New York this month. Have you gotten used to the yelling on the streets and people knowing who you are, where you go? Uh, no, I don't know. That, I'm not sure that's something you can ever get used to. It's always the, like, you know, six foot tall dude with this enormous beard who goes, hey man, love the show. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hey, I haven't played my hometown for a while. To play a character like Midge, who is not just an extrovert, but a stand-up comic, which is like the scariest profession you can yeah. have. How did you approach that when you first started? I, it's my worst nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> Um, no, it's dreamy in that it continues to be a reach, and that's very exciting. I've tried a lot of things, lots of preparation. Yeah. Uh, coffee, <laughs> lots of coffee. <laughs> Power posing in the mirror. I've actually tried really? it. Oh, what yeah. is that? I've never done that. Oh, you know, you just stand with your feet firmly planted on the ground and put mm. your hands on your hips and hold your head up high and, and just hope that it comes to you. Hope the confidence comes. Do you still feel that little pit in your stomach when it's time to get up on the stage and be midge up there? It, yes. Yeah. I think when you feel like you have nothing to lose, you you just stand at the you know at the edge of the plank every day and and make the decision to to dive off and just see what happens. It is strange to see Times Square. Is the naked cowboy still naked? The, oh, Rachel! Oh, Rachel! Oh, Rachel! The naked cowboy! The naked cowboy! The naked cowboy! Oh hi! Aren't you freezing? Wow. Uh-huh. I don't know that I needed to see that. <laughs> I had a very New York moment once in the subway over here. I caught Elmo with his pants down and peeing on the wall. Yeah. You are a New Yorker. <laughs> you That's are. what did it. <laughs> That's it for me. My name is Mrs. Maisel. Thank you and good night. I gotta say, she's a trooper too. I offered her a hat, a blanket, whatever she wanted. She said, I'm good. It was cold and it was snowy out there. That fourth season of The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel is coming later this year. And I'm Your Woman is available now on Amazon Prime Video. Our big thanks to the great PJ Clark's Restaurant for hosting our conversation. Don't forget to subscribe to the Sunday Sit Down podcast to hear the full length interview with Rachel Brosnahan. You can find it on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get yours. It has been a long year. Yeah, where it's been anything but normal. Well, now there's hope, the COVID vaccines. I know, I know, it's been a little confusing. Like really confusing. So it's more important than ever to make a plan. Visit planyourvaccine.com to find out where and when to get your vaccine. What are you waiting for? Roll up your sleeves and plan your vaccine. Plan your vaccine. Plan your vaccine. The Meet the Press Chuck Toddcast. Free wherever you get your podcasts. What should we watch for to find out whether this Geneva summit was worth it? What would it take for you to support this bipartisan infrastructure deal? What are the issues that the party stands for? That seems to be the missing piece here. If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. For breaking news in our changing world, 
Download the NBC News app. The Meet the Press Chuck Todd cast. Free wherever you get your podcasts. Midge <laughs> is a woman who is reinventing herself uh, Ooh, at a time good. in her life when she didn't think she would need to keep reinventing herself. She's finding her voice in a brand new way. Everything is new. She's discovering who she is and what she wants, and she wears a lot of fantastic hats while she does it. Abe is, uh, you know, he's uh, he's a guy who has uh, high standards and high expectations. So he lives in, uh, you know, a, just a steady state of, of disappointment and <laughs> um, and frustration. And uh, but he's, you know, he's he's uh, he's a guy who's is like his daughter. He's a bit of a, a bit of a fighter and uh, I think they're, you know, they, they, they're kind of cut from the same cloth in a way. For sure. Yeah. And, um, and he's just, uh, he, he's a man, you know, he's, uh, he's just a man of his time. It's late 1950s and season three, 1960. And he's, uh, he's struggling with a sort of cultural shift, shift in his family. So he's, um, he's, a, he's a man in crisis right now. Oh man. I love Midge's first day of work. I love the moment where she tells Abe that she's going to work for the first time, and he uh, the job at B. Altman. The, yes, the yeah. job at B. Altman. Oh, yeah. love um, and he he's trying to make sure that she has all her ducks in a row, and she's very excited to prove to him just how in a row all of her ducks are. You got a job. Yes. You have no resume. They hired me anyway. Do you know how to type? I don't need to. Okay. I also, I love everything in the Catskills. Welcome back to Steiner Mountain Resort. <laughs> You're home away from home. Oh, hi, <laughs> the Catskills is home for Midge. She's been going there her entire life. And it was nice to see a different, slightly more relaxed side of Midge. Yeah, I, I think my favorite scene uh, to shoot from the first two seasons and there were many many great moments but um, I think the first moment that that Abe sees Midge on stage oh, when she's man. performing and this boy he was my papa I and he he wanders into this um, club and not 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 knowing he's going to see her there of course and she steps out on stage, and he had no idea that this was that she was pursuing this line of work. And she starts talking. Uh, she she sees him and gets nervous. And <laughs> shooting that an scene was fascinating. <laughs> well, it was your performance in that scene is just I, I just think it's stunning. Right. The material was beautiful. The but the way Rachel uh, had to kind of have a foot in both worlds. It's connected to her. Her father and trying to do her act at the same time, it it was uh, it was just a really it was a beautiful beautiful scene. Thank you. It was kind of amazing for us to shoot because we I've been doing stand up alone really for Susie I guess for the we, first two seasons and that was the first time I guess Joel saw part of that one set but it really felt like right. the first time anyone else had ever been let into that world and I was so nervous to do that for you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was that was a that was a big big moment for I think for both of these characters in uh, in season 2. Yeah. Midge and Abe's father-daughter relationship is an evolving one. Um Amy Sherman Palladino who created the show always said to me that Midge is the kind of woman who aspires to be exactly like her mother. If all of her dreams came true, she would move a couple floors up in the same apartment building and uh, grow into her mother's dresses and, and have exactly the same kind of life that she had. And when everything explodes, I think she begins to realize that she actually has more in common with her father than she thought. And I think he begins to realize that too. They're, they have a, a totally different relationship post Joel than they did before. Right, right. And, and I think... Um the uh even even though it seems like abe and and midge are that the, the, there's tension and mm -hmm. and uh in their relationship and they're, they're somewhat take an adversarial stance mm -hmm. there's i think there's a real mutual respect yeah um he is he is disappointed and shattered that her 
her marriage has dissolved. Um, but on the other hand, he is, has, feels a sense of, of pride that she's an advocate for herself and that she's standing up for herself and that she has enough, uh, you know, feeling of self-worth that she is uh, not just going to, um, you know, succumb to the whims of her, her, her husband, her ex-husband. Mm -hmm. One of my favorite Midge quotes is during season two when she's talking about where comedy comes from and why women are great comics despite the fact that, that some men seem to think otherwise. And she talks about how comedy is fueled by oppression and lack of power and humiliation and sadness and disappointment. And then goes on to say, you know, by those standards, only women should be funny. Now think about this. Comedy is fueled by oppression, by the lack of power, by sadness and disappointment, by abandonment and humiliation. Now, who the hell does that describe more than women? <laughs> it's one of my favorite, favorite lines in the yeah. whole series. What about you? Uh, I, I just keep going back to that one scene. I think it was in season one yeah. when um, you've moved back into our apartment, I mean, but you've been sort of staying out late and uh -huh. and uh, Rose and I are sitting up, you know, <laughs> waiting up for you. Yeah. And I say, you know, your mother's been, your mother's been in the bathroom throwing up. Your mother vomited. I did not vomit. Well, she did something in the bathroom that took a very long time, and she did not come out looking happy. <laughs> it was we were shooting this late at night after a long day, and we kept. I kept. It was definitely you. I kept cracking up. I think it took about an hour and a half to shoot. But Tony's such a consummate lines. professional that you kept cracking up really in a very small way. So Tony would go. But then I, I think I did Your one take. Vomited. I think I did one take without cracking up, and then you and then cracked I laughed. up, and then I cracked. I up. know. Touchdown! Every morning, ten times, not just now and then. Yeah, you know the romper scene um, was. Uh, I, I mean, I just sort of took it in stride. I thought, well, this is an unusual getup, but uh, I just committed to the whole exercise routine and but the response has been just unbelievable what have Every, people said everyone talks about that romper as if um you know it, it it's <laughs> I, I know Marin suggested that, uh, yesterday that i um that i do like a workout tape abe's <laughs> abe's romper workout oh my god please you know please. And, and, and boot it on amazon I'm begging you you know and uh, I thought that's a kind of a good idea. I'll just make up a bunch of random stretches. But it has to be to the, chick the chicken song. To the chicken song, of course. <laughs> um, yeah, the, the response to the romper uh, is it has been has been just completely unexpected. And I'm convinced because what we because the Emmy win this year that that Emmy really belongs to Donna Zukowska, our costume designer. Well, she won one too. She did, but mine belongs to her too because. <laughs> None of the other actors in my category got to wear a romper, romper that se right. last season. But why do you think the show is so beloved? I, 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 I think it has something to do with it. Uh, you know, where it, it sort of takes us out of uh, the present time. It's kind of uh, it's refreshing. It's, it's a bit of a respite from from the uh, stresses that uh, of, the, of the current period that we're in. Yeah, it's and, uh, colorful and it's bright. It's, and yeah, and uh, you get invested in the characters and the in the relationships yeah. and the family, and and it's funny. I hope so. <laughs> it feels like there's something in it for everyone, which has been cool. I I never could have expected to hear from so many different people from so many different backgrounds, from different parts of the country and different parts of the world, yeah. who all have completely different ways in. For some people, it's that Midge is a woman who is not apologizing for following a new dream and for being exactly who she is. And for some people, it's the family element, the relationship with the parents. Um, some people have had similar experiences to the one that Mitch had with Joel, where their husbands or boyfriends or fiancés have left unexpectedly and they found mm. themselves lost. Some people just love the costumes. There's a nostalgia for the time the period. Cars. And the cars. 
Yeah. It's been really cool to hear from so many different people why they like it. But, paper, but we don't know what the secret sauce is. Uh, yeah, really. no one knows what it is. But on paper, you would think that uh, this would be this kind of material would just be sort of for a yeah. somewhat narrow demographic. Yeah. And yet the opposite has has uh, occurred, and, and yeah. it's just it's just a broad range of fans. Yeah, it's really satisfying. It has been a long year. Yeah, where it's been anything but normal. Well, now there's hope. The COVID vaccines. I know, I know. It's been a little confusing. Like, really confusing. So it's more important than ever to make a plan. Visit planyourvaccine.com to find out where and when to get your vaccine. What are you waiting for? Roll up your sleeves and plan your vaccine. Plan your vaccine. Plan your vaccine. Our week-long journey begins here in Orlando, Louisville, Kentucky. In Cleveland. Our Across America journey reporting on an America rebuilding and reimagining a future after the pandemic. Good evening tonight from Geneva, just hours away from his historic summit. Over 16,000 unaccompanied children tonight in custody. What's victory look like in this, or what does improvement look like? It's going to be a challenge to meet that 70% goal. Why is it so challenging? NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. Talent and perseverance inspiring America. I've been preparing for a moment like this for my whole life. I have lots of songs and lots of stuff to share. I want to show my daughter what it's like to overcome adversity. So many reasons to cheer for that young lady. NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. Good morning. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. bright. Yeah. We are going to be cheering you on all the way. Oda is going to renew their vows right here. Yes. Cheers to you. Yeah. Cheers. Cheers. We've been watching Chanel bust a move all morning. New meaning, TV expression, rise and shine. Jenna, nearly two miles in the air. Your Gampy would be so proud. Oh, thank you, Al. Good morning, welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. bright. We are going to be cheering you on all the way. Oda is going to renew their vows right here. Yes. Cheers to you. Cheers. In The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel, Rachel Brosnahan stars as the feisty and talented housewife who takes a gamble as a stand-up comedian when her marriage falls apart. So the Amazon comedy set in New York in the late 50s is a huge hit. We're talking about eight Emmy Awards right out of the gate. Now it's the eagerly awaited season two, and the family is struggling with new decisions. Take a look. Don't think about it. I've been thinking about it since dinner yesterday. We've been without food for 24 hours. Some people never have anything but bread soaked in water. Oh, that sounds delicious. For the sin which we committed before you went to the Notice your kid's been stuffing candy bars in his face the entire ceremony. His face is covered in chocolate. He looks like Al Jolson. Be quiet. We are in temple. That's right, and everyone can see that we're talking because these seats are fabulous. Only they were edible. Did you see Mara Weinstock? Six rows back. Oh, you got to get on this train if you're not already on it. Rachel Brosnahan, Tony Shalhoub, Baron Hinkle, Alex Borstein, Michael Zegan, and Kevin Pollack. Welcome, guys. Thank you. Wait a minute. Season two is already off and running. I can't help but think of that Emmy night. I, I actually went and rewatched it, you guys. It was the night where you guys swept cleaned up, won eight Emmys. Will you just take us back to that moment for one second, Rachel? You won one, Alex, you won one, the show won, you won a ton of them. What, what did it feel like in that moment? It was a complete whirlwind. I, I, I didn't know that we were that early in the show either, so it was suddenly like, I, I turned, by the time I got up there, everyone was gone. You were backstage, Amy was gone, I sort of said hi to Tony and went up and blacked out. <laughs> Are you shocked about just how much people have fallen in love with this show? It's interesting. It's an interesting time for the world to embrace a lot of Jewish people. <laughs> <laughs> we'll just live there for a Yeah. <laughs> and when I was looking at the faces of the rest of the people in the audience, and I think this is, this is catching on. And, Tony, you guys, you two actually have shot several scenes not just around here, but you've gone to the Catskills, you've gone to Paris. What are you finding about the show's popularity, not just here, but around the around the world? Well, when we were in Paris uh, shooting the first two episodes, we were surprised that uh, a lot of our Paris crew, the French crew, knew, knew and loved the show. We were being stopped on the street. And this was just based on just eight 
eight episodes of the first season. So it was amazing that it had, the reach was that that far, that broad. Rachel, I feel like your character was so ahead of her time. When I was watching this, I found myself nodding. I'm out, I found myself going like, you go, girl. You go out there and get it. What do you think it is about her that's resonating with so many women? I mean, I think she's somebody who's insatiably curious. Uh, she's self-empowered. Um, she's asking questions about the world around her. I think, you know, she's aspirational in some way because she shows that it's never too late to head down a new path. Right. To find your voice in a different way. So, Marin, when this show started, did you think to yourself, we got a hit, baby. I could feel it. Did you feel that? No. I, I, all I thought was, thank God, I have a job. <laughs> <laughs> which works. And also, I started to hear who I was going to get to work with. And the idea that I could be this one's wife and this one's mom and to work with these people. And I, I honestly, you're just so honored to have a job. But the one you get to hear that you work with Amy and Dan, you just kind of go, thank you. Talk about <laughs> the chemistry is undeniable on the show. I don't know if it's you guys, if it's the writing. What What is going on? Is this, are you guys all right off script? It's definitely or, us. Is it all, <laughs> yeah, it's all you? <laughs> what? Writing is pretty damn good. <laughs> but what is, I mean, because I, I guess at the Emmys, you guys said we already shot season two. We kind of already miss each other. Describe what this camaraderie is like. I think we spend a lot of time even at work reminding each other, this is amazing, right? Yeah. This is crazy. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we're still in that mode. Uh, of being astonished for, for the great words, for the great eight-page scene wonders. You know, all, this kind of work just doesn't exist for the most part. And, and we're, we're just as curious as yeah. the audience is to see what happens to these characters. Well, you play the husband yeah. that was the jerk, <laughs> and your name is Joel. I have a Joel, too, in this. But I heard that the writers were saying that you are kind of your own little Nielsen ratings box. Like, you could tell how well the show was going to do by all the chicks who came up to you on the street and said, like, yeah. Joel! No, I have no idea what they're talking about. <laughs> uh, they're talking about me. I I it was and mine. Tony. It was me. No, uh, <laughs> I used to get a lot of people coming up to me and being like, you know, you're, you're, I mean, essentially the jerk from that show. But now yeah. they just tell me how much they love it. And it's so nice, you know, just knowing that people are watching it and, yeah. and enjoying it as much as we I are. Mean, I just want to say, I think Susie's actually the most handsome man on the show. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Sexiest man. Well, Alex, I was going to say, it's you're so, so quiet and you are such a scene stealer, literally. Like when you show up, I just wait for you to drop like one of your, one of your bombs. You want you want an, you want an F bomb? Is that <laughs> <laughs> Can I point out, too, that Carnegie Deli has created, like, its own sandwich that has to do with your show, and they actually distributed them into our control what? room. Yeah. Wow. The they're mazel? Our, our, it's the mazel. The they're, already, the mazel. Yeah, they're already eating it right down. So I guess, oh, oh, actually, my better have guessed that it was brisket. Is that... And what okay. is it, you guys? Do y'all know? What's the roast beef. Oh, okay. Oh. Close it enough. Does it only cost about 50 cents? It costs 50 cents. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you guys, thank you. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. bright. Are you ready? We're going to do our part to spread the word on the importance of vaccines. So crucial for reopening America. A big day around here. A very special naturalization ceremony. Many of them doctors, nurses, other essential workers. If you are a nurse, thank you. Spring has sprung, guys, and we want to fill this season with some fun and surprises. Yes, this is the face of excitement. Uh, celebrating Earth Day. Let's change the world. Love it! For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. The Meet the Press Chuck Todd cast, free wherever you get your podcasts. Good morning. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. bright. We are going to be cheering you on all the way. Olga is going to renew their vows right here. Yes. Cheers to you. Cheers. To the expression, eyes and shine. Sometimes the news can be difficult and overwhelming for kids to understand. The coronavirus come back next year. So to help make sense of it all, we've created a newscast just for them. Man, you know a lot. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. Talent and perseverance inspiring America. I've been preparing for a moment like this for my whole life. I have lots of songs and lots of stuff to share. I want to show my daughter what it's like to overcome adversity. So many reasons to cheer for that young lady. NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. The Meet the Press Chuck Todd cast. Free wherever you get your podcasts.
go sailing together, just the two of us. We ski together. We do triathlons together. Meet Constantine Mavrudis and Constantine Mavrudis, a father and son who share much more than a name. We have actually been doing triathlons together for about 20 years. Yeah, that's right. Wow. Is, is the know. dynamic competitive or do you? No, 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 I can't on? compete. With, no, I can't compete with him. He's he's just, he's too fast. Come on, Constantine, you got this, buddy, come on. You're looking good, buddy, come on. The younger Constantine, who goes by Const, might best his dad in a race, but he's following his father's footsteps in a big way as a pediatric congenital heart surgeon. In many ways, it's kind of like being a mechanic. I mean, you're, you're, you're taking apart an engine, you're putting it back together, you know, you're hoping that it works well in the end. With a 40-year career, the elder Constantine is one of the field's most prominent doctors, now saving lives at Peyton Manning Children's Hospital at Ascension St. Vincent in Indianapolis. Sometimes these hearts can be no bigger than a large uh, chestnut. It's up to people like Constant and I to fix them. Const started picking his dad's brain about hearts at an early age. There were times that I remember you, know, you go to restaurants that have you know, the paper instead of you know, the cloth uh, uh, on the tables. And I would ask him questions about heart disease and he would draw little diagrams. <laughs> But the boy, curious about hearts, almost became an orthopedic surgeon instead. I really didn't want to do what my father does. And tell me about some of the reasons why you didn't think you wanted to do what your dad did. It's tough. I'm, uh, when your father literally wrote a textbook, uh, <laughs> so when you know people can say you know he wrote the book on it, uh, he kind of did. Uh, that that can be that can be difficult. But in the end, I mean, it was it became something that I just couldn't I couldn't resist. He's now finishing his residency at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, and together they're only the fifth father and son ever in this profession. It's a pretty rare connection uh, that we have, and the fact that we have the exact same name um, means that you know, <laughs> I get his emails, sometimes he gets mine. Uh, he and I talk a lot about what uh, went wrong in an operation or what could have been better. It gives me a great opportunity to have this wonderful connection with my father. But when it comes to the heart, there are bigger lessons a son learns from his dad. There were two major maxims uh, growing up. One was remember your last name, uh, and the other was be aware of others. My wife and I are, are pregnant, uh, and these are kind of the, the major things that I'm going to try to, <laughs> thank you. Uh, Yay, congratulations. Are, <laughs> are, uh, these are the things that, that she and I uh, value very highly and are going to do our best to impart to our children. What sort of values did, did you want to instill and, and what do you see in him? Well, he would be the first to say, you lead from the front, you lead by example. I have pride, but I didn't take his exams. I didn't do his residency for him. He did that himself. If there was anything that I did, I maybe held up uh, an example. And what do you want to see for, for his career going forward? Oh, he's already doing it. God bless him. I just hope that I live to 120 to see it all. Oh, I couldn't love it more. Oh my gosh, they were such a great father and son to, to have this conversation with. And one of the things that Const says also inspired him, his dad came home from work happy every oh, day. Nice. And, you know, even with the ups and downs of, of the business that they're in, um, there could be some tough days. But but he, you know, they, they would talk through those and most of the time his dad was happy. Pediatric right. hearts, you're an angel. Yeah. Pediatric hearts are They're angel? doing God's work. It's amazing. <laughs> Tonight, we're on the scene as the urgent search for survivors is underway after the deadly collapse of a high-rise building. Buildings don't fall down in America like this. The Delta variant. What does this mean for people who are fully vaccinated? NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. The Meet the Press Chuck Todd cast. Free wherever you get your podcasts. Good morning. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. bright. We are going to be cheering you on all the way. Hoda is going to renew their vows right here. Yeah. Cheers to you. Cheers. New meaning, plenty the expression, rise and shine.
morning. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. bright. We are going to be cheering you on all the way. Hoda is going to renew their vows right here. Yes. Cheers to you. Cheers. The expression, rise and shine. The Meet the Press Chuck Todd cast. Free wherever you get your podcasts. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Ask anybody you know, and one thing they'll probably tell you is they are super, super busy. Whether you're taking care of kids or taking care of older parents, it can all be exhausting and overwhelming, and you might be missing some of life's best moments. But you know what? It doesn't have to be that way. Clinical psychologist Shafali Sabari is the author of The Awakened Family, and she says it's all about being present and conscious in your daily life. Welcome. Thanks for joining us. Thank Great you. Great to see you. So and by the way, the Dalai Lama wrote the foreword to her book. So you're... Mage. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's true. Well, you know what's funny? I think we sprint through life. Andy and I have been talking about this, too, in the makeup room. We're sprinting through life, and we're missing life. Like, we're trying to do yeah. everything, and we're missing some of the most important things. I think we, we're all on that train. Well, and that's why when you have a child, an infant, and I know both of you are new parents, that's when you begin to realize that life is to be lived in the moment, you know, and to center yourself and to get grounded in the moment. And infants especially teach us to do that, to drop the doing yeah. and to just enter the being and mm -hmm. what is a tip that you can give us about being conscious as a family yeah well I think you know conscious parenting really speaks to the fact that the real children we have to raise are mm -hmm. the ones within us hmm. and to become conscious of all our own emotional baggage and keep it out of the room and the more we heal ourselves the more we'll be present and not put our stuff onto others or our children. Well, you know, it's funny. I was walking down the street with Haley one day, and I still remember it because she declared to some stranger on the street, like, oh, I have pockets. And I remember I looked at her, mm -hmm. and I could have been like, great, honey, you have pockets. Let's go. Come on, we're late, we're late. But for a second, I just sat in it. And I remember, and I remember it right now that that happened. And there have been so many other instances where we've been in a rush. Great, great, sweetie. I know you're pretending. Yay, yay, yay. We got to go. Right. Take her hand right. and run. Right. We're all on this rush to nowhere. Yes. To nowhere. Where are we, go where where are we are rushing we to? Right. Right. Because we're incessantly anxious. One you know? of your yeah. um, things that you talk about is that parents need to give up their need to control. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, how do they do that? <laughs> well, the, the traditional parenting paradigm is all about control. And these children are my children. They're yeah. my possessions. So what I try to teach and espouse is that they just come through you, as Khalil Gibran <laughs> said, and they're not, yours. they're not yours. So they are their own sovereign beings. So when you understand that they have their own destiny to unfold into, and your role is just to be an usher and a guide, that then you won't micromanage them and hover around them because that just speaks to your own anxiety. It's never really about the kid. It's about our own anxiety that leads to this control. Well, what if it is time to go to bed? And I want to put, it's time for, for right. her yeah, to go to the, bed. The parent's role is to right. create to, a schedule and yeah. a plan. Right, right. Structure. so creating a container is very different from being in control and oh. imposing a sort of agenda that comes from your own deep-rooted expectation. Of course you contain, contain them and you have a schedule and you try to abide by it, but you also work in a negotiated way with your child. You know, And I think parents forget that our children need to be allowed to unfold into their own. Yeah, you know, we're too busy trying to, yeah, yeah, to micromanage them, them. And slot them into little boxes of time. How can Hoda make bedtime more enjoyable <laughs> for little Haley Joy? Well, I think bedtime is really one of those sacred times. Yeah. And, and I know we're so exhausted. Yeah. I used to call it the witching hour. Yeah. You're good, you're good, you're good. And then after one minute after nine and you become a real yeah. lunatic yeah. Right. because we're exhausted. So we have to prepare for that time. You know, we have to have good boundaries during the day, take care of ourselves. Right. Because that's the time our children want to connect. And they don't right. want to leave Rush us. Right. And right. They don't, right. They're having separation anxiety. Yeah. Right. So we need to prepare for this sacred bonding time. Oh, that was great. Thank you. Thank we you really so appreciate much. You. you can find The Awakened Family on today.com slash shop. What should we watch for to find out whether this Geneva summit was worth it? What would it take for you to support this bipartisan infrastructure deal? What are the issues that the party stands for? That seems to be the missing piece here. If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press.
morning. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. bright. USA! We are going to be cheering you on all the way. Oda is going to renew their vows right here. Yes. Cheers to you. Cheers. To the expression, eyes and shine. A recent Gallup survey found about one in six Gen Z adults identify as part of the LGBTQ community. So as you can imagine, the coming out process affects countless families. But each story is unique, and I sat down with two families to talk about their journey to embracing their LGBTQ children. Take a look. It was kind of like a weight lifted off of me, but it kind of brought, opened up a whole new can of worms. Seven years ago, Miles Foster sat his parents down for what would be a life-changing conversation. He told them he was bisexual. We were thinking, well, what does this really mean? Miles was just 15 at the time, and for his parents, Rodney and Valencia Foster, the news came with a wave of emotions and concern. He's a young black man, and now you're part of the LGBTQ community. So now you're talking about two different ways that people can discriminate against you. We've already always looked at Miles as the answer to God's prayer. When he came out, I was like, well, wait, this is this blessing from God. This, this doesn't make sense. The Los Angeles-based family struggled to figure out how this could all fit with their own church community, which had largely supported a ban on same-sex marriage. Every time we went to church on Sunday, we're hearing gay people vilified. I knew that there was something wrong here. I, I, I wasn't in conflict with God and with my son. I have to choose my son or choose God. It's like, so I chose both. Valencia and Rodney each took their own paths to a better understanding of their son and their faith. I went and found some other group of Christians that were outwardly gay, but also Christian. And they helped me out and we started to talk. I found a Facebook group of moms who were women who were also trying to reconcile their faith and their child's identity. While the Fosters are now closer than ever, Valencia still wishes she had reacted better when Miles first came out. We said we love him. We said we support him no matter who he is or who he loves. But, you know, there were nights where I was crying in my room. Valencia, I see that there's still raw emotion to this. Looking back on my initial response, I still feel like I should have just celebrated him for just even for the courage. And thinking about him going through what he was going through all the years before he said something. I just wish I had more of a soft landing for him. Valencia and Rodney have since become advocates for the LGBTQ community through the organization Free Mom Hugs. I'm very blessed to have been born into this family. I feel very lucky every single day. For Carl and Kristen Horton of Austin, Texas, their teenagers coming out felt more like an education. He did a PowerPoint for us, yes. like projected it to the screen. I didn't know if they were going to understand what I meant when I said, I'm trans, I'm gender fluid, I'm non-binary, whatever. I thought it was a school project <laughs> and he was explaining what gender fluidity was. And at the end, he, the he, was like, no. I'm like, why do we have this presentation? Because I'm gender fluid, I'm trans. I was like, oh. Clay was assigned female at birth and his parents sometimes had a difficult time adjusting. I would have been surprised if someone told me the worst thing is gonna be when they change their name. And we chose a name that was, um, you know, had a lot of meaning. It was Carl's um, grandmother, who we loved dearly. But we also recognized that this was part of the process. It was really hard for my mom. She was really worried about transitioning and what that meant for pregnancy later on. Clay is such a caretaker. I always associated that with someday Clay being a mom. Mm -hmm. And being able to switch that and to be able to say, okay, so Clay may be a dad someday. Both Carl and Kristen have since joined PFLAG, a group of parents, friends, and allies to the LGBTQ community. I think the biggest aha for me was other dads who were there who were really struggling with the same challenge, and, and, and much of it was the basic of like safety, physical safety, mental health, spiritual health, 
and making sure that our kids were able to spread their wings and blossom. My parents have taken like up the torch and have really continued to work to make our community safer for LGBT kids, which I'm really proud of. How would you describe the person Clay is today? Messy. He <laughs> plays the same person, just uh, just better. I don't see fear in Clay's eyes anymore. I do hope he knows how much I love and respect him, but I, I also know that it was a pause. And I wish that I didn't have a pause of, you know, from being informed to being supportive. How is your relationship with your parents today? It's really good. Uh, I'm still 20 years old, so I won't say that we don't fight over stuff, like who's using the car when, but I always feel like they'll have my back. No matter what happens, they'll still be there to help me. These two families' journeys actually brought them closer together in the end. And for more stories like this and original content about the LGBTQ community, go to today.com slash pride. Okay, those were yes. beautiful stories. I still uh, struck by how the parents said, I wish I would have done better. It yes. seemed like they did so, so well, uh, but I it know. was all about love. Yeah. And you know, the key is to, I think they were always close-knit from the beginning. Yeah. Yeah. That's They're just uh, very beautiful yeah. families. Okay, so coming up next, some advice and lessons for all parents on the best ways to support our kids. Right after this. Before the break, we met two families who shared their coming out journeys. Yeah, which led us to ask if your child comes out to you, would you know what to say and do? Or better yet, would you know what not to say and do and still show your love and support? So we called on the experts, of course, for advice. Psychiatrist Dr. Janet Taylor is with us and family therapist Linda Reeves. She's the co-founder of the Manhattan Beach P-Flag chapter and the proud mom of a gay son. Welcome to both of you. And Linda, I, just to start with you for a second, I think Jen and I were both struck by how those parents that we just saw in that piece had such beautiful responses, but yet they felt like they could have done better. What could they have done better? Mm -hmm. You know, I think that their stories were both so beautiful and um, the, the loving and caring is always going to be number one, no matter if you kind of have a feeling uh, about it or if you're shocked. And I think a lot of parents um, don't really aren't, aren't prepared right so what you want to do is just always lead with love mm -hmm. and uh, let them know that you love them and that you support them and that you'll be in their corner always mm -hmm. which is what those families did and, yeah. and you say that you when your son came out to you you even wished you had you of yeah. course said I love you and yeah. you, but that you wish you had done things differently what do you wish you had done that parents watching now can take notes of you know, I think one of the things, well, there's a couple, but the, one of the things is that parents don't really understand how long that the child has been living mm -hmm. with uh, these thoughts and these and, and worries, right? They're really so uncertain about how you're going to respond, if you're going to uh, believe them, if you're going to support them, uh, where religion is involved. That's a huge factor that a lot of kids really struggle to, their, their family's religious, like, the one example. So what I really was looking back is that I had spent more time asking my son what it had been like for him mm -hmm. to have, you know, go to bed at night with his head on the pillow, mm -hmm. worried about what he was going to oh. say, when he was going to tell us, how he was going to tell us. Um, so I think there's a lot of trauma that parents don't really understand that kind yeah, of lies behind yeah, the surface. Yeah, Dr. Taylor, I think a lot of um, parents try to be kind of cheerleadery after they hear this. Either they'll say something like, well, well, I always thought that. Yeah, I always suspected I that or I knew it all along. Or else they kind of quickly get on the bandwagon with rainbows and everything. Um, and I think they, they go to the other extreme. Well, you're, you're absolutely right. And the fact is, you know, so often we think as parents, we have to protect our children mm -hmm. and that when they come out that, you know, by protecting them, sometimes we will have to really look at our own judgments and what we are protecting them from. It's not a time to feel sorry for them, but certainly to create a space that they can talk to us. And what we want to do is take their lead, but also acknowledge how you feel. So it, 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 it's also time not to bash yourself mm -hmm. because, you know, as both families showed, 
even though something is really difficult, they both be, they all became better. And that is the goal. So don't be too hard on yourself, but certainly create that space for your children to talk to you. Okay, should we talk about the do's and don'ts? Y'all yeah. have some really good do's and don'ts. Um, Linda, can we start with you? What should we do and what should we not? Well, I think a lot of uh, parents are concerned um, that their child uh, really knows what's going on. Uh, so believing your child, you know, that it is their truth. Uh, it may be an evolving identity story that, that they're or journey that they're on, but don't question them or, or make comments about that they're not old enough to know or experienced enough to have, you know, to make this kind of declaration. Okay, mm -hmm. um, and Dr. Taylor, yeah, what do you? What are some things that parents should stay away from? Because I think some parents may be shocked when they hear the news, and mm -hmm. their first reaction isn't to wrap their arms around them, even though it should be what they do. Yeah, so don't label, don't judge, certainly watch the language that you use and take the opportunity. It, it is shocking and maybe painful for some parents. And again, you have to be with that, but also really ask your child or your teen open into questions. Ask them, uh, you know, questions like, what do you want me to know? How can I help oh, you? Um, yeah. Educate yourself as a parent. Look at documentaries, read, join supportive organizations like PFLAG so you realize you're not alone and really are informed to partner with them as they take this journey. Yeah, I think some parents say, well, I, I love you no matter what. Well, that's no matter what is not great. Yeah. That's like, you and know, I also despite think this. One of the great um, yeah. pieces of advice you all have that we that we should get to really quickly is to ask questions and to yeah. listen. Yeah. You know, yeah. Dr. Taylor. Yeah, certainly you want to ask, not assume, and listen from a place of understanding, not thinking about what you're going to say next, mm -hmm. even though it, it may be completely different with how you grew up and what you think, mm -hmm. but listen mm -hmm. to understand and certainly with love. And I loved how those families found a space for their faith mm. part of their life and the family part of their life. Uh, you guys, thank you thank so much. You. This was really enlightening. We appreciate it. Morning. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. We are going to be cheering you on all the way. Oga is going to renew their vows right here. Yes. Cheers to you. Cheers. See the expression? Rise and shine. Tonight we're on the scene as the urgent search for survivors is underway after the deadly collapse of a high-rise building. Buildings don't fall down in America like this. The Delta variant. What does this mean for people who are fully vaccinated? NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. The Meet the Press Chuck Todd cast, free wherever you get your podcasts. Good morning, welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. bright. Yeah. We are going to be cheering you on all the way. Oda is going to renew their vows right here. Yes. Cheers to you. Here. Cheers. Cheers. We've been watching Chanel bust a move all morning. New meaning, to the expression, rise and shine. Jenna, nearly two miles in the air. Your Gampy would be so proud. Oh, thank you, Al. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. The Meet the Press Chuck Todd cast. Free wherever you get your podcasts. Mom, are you ready to become a grandmother? I am absolutely ready. What kind of grandma are you going to be? I will spoil. <laughs> I will treat. But mainly, I can't wait until she gets old enough to go shopping. <laughs> Dylan, you are expecting your third. We're working our brain around the logistics of living in a New York City apartment with three boys, but you know, the excitement of, of meeting someone that no one has met. Laura, who's one of my oldest friends, knows what it's like to be the mom of a girl. She has two girls. Zoe is going into sixth grade. She is graduating from a cubby, we say, to a locker. She's gonna have homeroom. I don't know if I would know how to be a mom to a girl. You would learn instantly. <laughs> <laughs> my girls are, they're pretty mellow. I think what my husband and I are anticipating are all of the, the hormonal and all of the changes that'll come when they're teenagers. Julie, what exactly was Kristen like as a child? Was she mellow? <laughs> no. Once I got a call from nursery school that Kristen had broken her leg because she was pretending to be Wonder Woman and jumped off a chair. 
No, no, no. That shows you how active she was. What did you learn that, that you would pass along to my daughter? Well, I would just tell your daughter to be herself just as we wanted you to be yourself. Dylan, what are some of the lessons you've learned along the way? There's such an, a, a roller coaster of emotions that you're going to go through because at first it's like this sweet smelling, amazing little just bundle of, of love. And then after several nights of losing sleep, your mind starts to go crazy. You know, I would think, um, oh, she needs music. And then be like, oh wait, that's too much music. She needs some <laughs> movement. Oh, that's too much movement. And this like quest to find the perfect balance. When she slept through the night, I got up in the morning and panic set in. Do you ever have a moment like that where Zoe and Una slept through the night and you thought, what's going on? Oh, absolutely, except I was like, this is wonderful. Because <laughs> <laughs> you were becoming a mom yes. and the business world was not as supportive of working moms. Was that That's tough? Yes, I didn't know it was tough because it just seemed very natural for us to be together. I just went to work with you. You just went yes, right I put her in her little basket, set her on the desk, and did real estate. You're an educator, Laura, in Hawaii, and you have really passed along a love of education and reading to your two girls. I used to have books in the car, and I used to read stories when they were eating. It really did kind of set this love of stories and reading into my girls. And so when they'll be at the dinner table, they'll bring their books, and I'm like, hey, we're eating. When you first bring that baby home and you think, oh my goodness, I'm so worried. Dylan, what's the best can, advice? For can I answer that first? Yes, you Go can. ahead. The best <laughs> advice is to call your mom. <laughs> <laughs> You need your mom. You need, you know, Absolutely. you need the grandparents around because they know everything and you know nothing. But there's this moment of you just want it to be you and John and look at each other and say, we got this. You know, I'm actually gonna share some Julie Welker advice where she taught us, this too shall pass. And I think that's so true with children. The issue of this hour is gonna change to the issue of the next hour. Right. How do you preserve it, mom? Record it, you know, write it down, take photos. And again, the most important thing is to spend as much time with her. And I love you so much. I love you too, mom. And Dylan and Laura, I love you guys too. <laughs> Whew, that's a little emotional to watch back. Dylan, such great advice. Thank you for being a part of that conversation. For what My it's mom worth. My mom loved it. Laura loved it. There's, there's also, I mean, no advice that you can honestly give to, to a new mom because you're, you're going to just figure it out yourself. I know. Well, I've learned so much from you and you, Peter, a dad to the two most beautiful girls. You've got you've got two babysitters blocks away if you need us at any time <laughs> we are there. But honestly, as much preparation as you did for that debate about a year ago, <laughs> you are more than you could possibly pre prepared for this. We are so thrilled for you. We've been giving you as many pieces of advice and gifts as we can. So the gift I have as you depart today Another one? is less for the baby and more for you and John because it is the start <laughs> of summer and you guys entitled a little moment to celebrate Aww. yourself. So a toast to you guys. <laughs> Aww, a little margarita cocktail kit. That is so sweet of you. We get one more margarita because yeah. <laughs> no more. The then it's day. game on. <laughs> exactly. It'll help you it get some sleep in on. the final days. I want both of you to be prepared for lots of middle of the night phone calls for me, asking for yes. more advice. Text. You guys have just showered me in love. I'm so grateful. Text me anytime. And I also want to say you'll never have enough onesies or diapers. They'll they'll spit up. <laughs> you know they'll make a mess of all of them. But this one you might want to you might want to save to the side. Oh, yeah. You don't really want to stay in this one just in case you're Dylan, missing Peter I while you're gone. We'll I'm leave pinning that. that up on the nursery. We'll leave that one in the drawer I think for a little while. Dylan appreciate that very much. And this morning, we are kicking off the series, marking the milestones of the community and also the ongoing struggle for equality. You know, we start with the journey through the HIV AIDS epidemic, nearly 40 years to the day since the first case of AIDS was diagnosed in this country. NBC News Now anchor Joe Fryer sat down with those who lived through the crisis. Joe, good morning. Hey there, good morning. So it was June 5th of 1981 when the first five cases of a mysterious disease were first reported, a disease that would later become known as AIDS. Since then, 
the disease has claimed more than 700,000 lives in America. And today, more than 1.1 million people in the U.S. are living with HIV. Now, many are undetectable, healthy and thriving, including actor Billy Porter, who recently became public with his diagnosis. This morning, we want to reflect on four decades of pain and progress. At first, the deadly intruder did not have a name. The lifestyle of some male homosexuals has triggered an epidemic of a rare form of cancer. But it quickly developed a reputation. And the deaths kept coming and coming. The fear was palpable. I was terrified of passing on HIV to someone else. But in the years that followed, it was pretty miraculous for me. So was the bravery. Because of them, I can live a healthy and happy life. We sat down with four gay men from four different generations, all living with HIV. The oldest is Jesse Myland, who's still haunted by the beginning of the epidemic. People who, because they had been diagnosed, suddenly disappeared. And, and we all knew what that silence meant. Jesse was diagnosed in the 80s after losing his partner, George, and so many others. It was hard. It was a very hard. At the time, many leaders were accused of ignoring the crisis because it was deemed a gay disease. President Reagan didn't give his first major speech on AIDS until 1987, six years after the first diagnosed case. We must have a definition of AIDS. For Dr. Anthony Fauci, the epidemic was a turning point. In 1984, he became the nation's top infectious disease expert, the same job he holds today. When there is resistance, was it hard to get the resources you needed? Well, in the beginning, it was. I mean, we, we, we were trying to convince people that this was not something that was going to go away. This is something that was going to get worse and worse. To raise awareness, the AIDS memorial quilt was unveiled on the National Mall. Joe Fratini. His organizers read the names of those who died. Some shared their stories publicly, including actor Rock Hudson, teen Ryan White, who tested positive after a blood transfusion, real world star Pedro Zamora, and basketball legend Magic Johnson. In 1995, a combo therapy known as the AIDS cocktail was ushered in, followed by even better medications offering hope. But there was no cure for the stigma. Right now, there are millions of people with HIV suffering from social rejection because they and other people believe that they're infectious, and, and they're not. Diagnosed in 2003, Bruce Richmond says he was terrified of giving HIV to someone else. So I, I didn't love. I just, I, I isolated myself. I was depressed, and at times I was, I was suicidal. But then he learned medication could reduce his viral load to undetectable levels, meaning he couldn't transmit the virus. So Bruce started an advocacy group and coined the phrase, you equals you, undetectable equals untransmittable, a message endorsed by the CDC. So it gave me hope. It meant that I could be, I could be intimate. People with HIV can live healthy lives and, and not pass on the virus to anyone. And that's a revolution. Today, about 38,000 Americans are still diagnosed each year. DeAndre Moore was 19. I remember staring at a window covered in butterfly stickers. In that moment, all I could think was, damn, if, if I could be one of those butterflies and just fly away from here, then everything is going to be OK. Ray F. Durazi had a similar reaction. He was 27. So I knew next to nothing about what it meant to be diagnosed with HIV. It was a steep learning curve. And what did you learn? <laughs> well, I learned that I'm not going to die. I'm, I'm alive and well. You think back to that moment with the butterfly. What would you tell yourself in that moment? You're going to be OK. You're going to be just as beautiful. <laughs> Today, all four of these men are undetectable. And all are advocates sharing their stories to educate the public and fight the stigma. It's taken us 30 years of the AIDS crisis to teach the whole world that our lives and our loves are equal to everyone else. It blows my mind just how far we've come and then just what's possible now, so. What, what is possible now? <laughs> my mind immediately says what isn't possible. That's the answer.
Another key breakthrough in recent years, PrEP. It's a daily pill that people who are HIV negative can take to prevent getting the disease. As for an HIV AIDS vaccine, well, that has not happened yet. But Dr. Fauci tells me he is cautiously optimistic that someday we will have a vaccine that is successful. 26-year-old DeAndre Moore, who you saw there, hopes that he is someday going to be part of an AIDS-free generation. And we want to give a big thank you to three organizations that helped us with that story there, the AIDS Healthcare Foundation, AIDS United, and the Prevention Access Campaign. It's incredible mm -hmm. to see how far we've come in those decades. We all remember those scenes mm -hmm. in the 80s, but there still is a stigma. Isn't that what you learned? Yeah, there is. And it's actually kind of amazing, especially with young people, which is surprising. So a recent survey of HIV-negative millennials found that nearly a third of them say they avoid hugging, talking to, or even being friends with someone with HIV. People living with HIV often report being hesitant still to openly share their status because they fear losing friends or family or they even fear abuse, whether it's physical, emotional, or mental. Just reminds us of Billy Porter just, just last week yep. who just who just announced what it. What a big he, sign of bravery yeah. even now. It's needed now, right. just yeah. as more than before. And he waited 14 years, yeah. waited to tell his mother, mm -hmm. so that stigma is still there. Right. Yeah. Joe, so thank you. Thank you, Joe. Thank you. The Meet the Press Chuck Toddcast, free wherever you get your podcasts. What should we watch for to find out whether this Geneva summit was worth it? What would it take for you to support this bipartisan infrastructure deal? What are the issues that the party stands for? That seems to be the missing piece here. If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. It has been a long year. Yeah, where it's been anything but normal. Well, now there's hope. The COVID vaccines. I know, I know, it's been a little confusing. Like, really confusing. So it's more important than ever to make a plan. Visit planyourvaccine.com to find out where and when to get your vaccine. What are you waiting for? Roll up your sleeves and plan your vaccine. Plan your vaccine. Plan your vaccine. Good morning. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. bright. Yeah. We are going to be cheering you on all the way. Hoda is going to renew their vows right here. Yeah. Cheers to you. Cheers. the expression, eyes and shine. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Talent and perseverance inspiring America. I've been preparing for a moment like this for my whole life. I have lots of songs and lots of stuff to share. I want to show my daughter what it's like to overcome adversity. So many reasons to cheer for that young lady. NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. The Meet the Press Chuck Todd cast. Free wherever you get your podcasts. This morning we're lucky we're joined by a powerhouse <laughs> Hollywood producer. Will Packer is behind films like Straight Outta Compton and Girls Trip, and now he's sharing his knowledge with a new generation of filmmakers. Will is partnering with NBC Universal for the Scene in Color film series. It's sponsored by Target and promises to be an incredible opportunity for emerging stars. And Will, thank you for sticking around <laughs> through all of that. We're so glad to have you this morning. Sorry, I had to see that. Are you kidding me? Listen, I'm here for the vintage Chanel footage. That's Thank why you. I'm here. Thank you, Will. <laughs> so are we. Looking good. The glow up is real. Thank That's what you. I was the glow up is real. I'm putting that on the show. I love that. All right. Well, um, besides <laughs> Chanel's vintage footage, um, tell us more about the Scene in Color uh, film series and why it was so important to get involved. Yeah, it's really cool. I got to tell you guys, I'm so excited about it. It's really a continuation of work that I've been doing for, for almost 30 years since I made my first film, which is trying to make sure that we get underrepresented voices in our industry, people that would not have the opportunity. So we scoured everywhere. I'm talking film festivals and online forums to find three amazing up and coming black filmmakers. And that's what we find. We found they won this contest and now they're going to have their work featured across NBC Universal and all their platforms. Target is a big sponsor of this. This is an example of corporations doing the right thing, supporting folks and putting their money where their intentions are. But these new filmmakers, remember these names, Addison Wright, Eureka Dawson Amoa, Christian King, this is the next generation of filmmaker that we're going to be hearing about for a very, very long time. This is when we're at our best, right? This is, you know, the new global mainstream is multi-perspective, multi-ethnic, multi-racial. This is the important thing. I'm proud to be a part of this work. Really. And, right. and Will, is, is the point of this to get the pipeline going where you bring in this next generation who will bring in the generation after that? And now we've, we've kind of uh, seeded a whole new group of people with a different voice. 
You got it, Al. That's it. That's what we have to be doing is bring because see the thing is you can't just create like a new filmmaker, a new voice, new perspective, and have underrepresented people have an opportunity to create their stories if the pipeline's not there. If you don't take filmmakers who are just starting out, who are just aspiring, and give them a true chance at mentorship, get them a true chance to see their work be seen on the largest forums and the largest stages. That's how you create a pipeline so that now in the years to come. We will have an industry that looks far more diverse than it looks now. That's the work that's being done. And, and switching gears really quickly, we're looking behind you. We've got girls ship there behind you. We talked earlier about, you know, straight out of Compton, Stomp the Yard. First of all, really quickly, is there going to be another girls trip too? Everybody was tweeting <laughs> and texting me, asking me if I'll ask you. Hey, let me tell you something. Here it is. Right now, okay. you're going to okay. hear it closer than we have ever been. That's okay. what I was. All right. Okay, okay. And we're advice. Excited, so we're getting there. I Absolutely. Love it. And what about advice yeah. for somebody who wants to follow in your footsteps? You know, here's what I would say. Somebody's watching this and would say, well, I didn't get a chance to be a part of this program. I didn't win this. And by the way, all our filmmakers are getting a, a blind script deal. And what that wow. basically means is that they're getting a chance to be commissioned to write a script sight unseen, right? It's about their voices, not about a specific project. And that is huge. That is like the gold standard of something that you can get in our industry. So they're going to be mentored by folks like me and others. But if you're watching this and you say, you know, I want to get in this industry and I didn't win this competition, I'm not a part of this series, that's okay. Do not give up. It's a mm -hmm. tough industry, but you control your own destiny. It's your voice. It's your vision. Your dream is not over, even if you get told no a million times. It's not over until you say it's over. So maintain control of your destiny and do not give up and keep working and working and grinding, and you will be successful. And you got to believe that. You got to make that a self fulfilling prophecy. I really believe that. Wow. We're all well, that in. Was, I know. Thank you. Motivation. <laughs>the news can be difficult and overwhelming for kids to understand. The coronavirus come back next year. So to help make sense of it all, we've created a newscast just for them. Man, you know a lot. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. Welcome back. Next Monday, May 31st, marks 100 years since the beginning of what's become known as the Tulsa Reese Massacre. It was a deadly and coordinated attack on an African-American neighborhood. It is a story that for decades was swept under the rug out of shame and fear. NBC's Harry Smith joins us with more. Hey, Harry, good morning. It's hard to imagine a neighborhood like Greenwood in Tulsa, right? A place that was so financially self-sufficient it was thought that Booker T. Washington called it the Black Wall Street. Wow. Money in this neighborhood would exchange 12 times before it came back out again. Mm -hmm. What happened there was so heinous, so racist, that it was really literally swept under the rug and well hidden for decades. 
Hard to comprehend what happened there, unless, of course, you lived it. On June 1st, 1921, nine-year-old Eldoris Makondici was awakened by her mother. What her mother said next, she never forgot. She says, we have to go out, get out. I said, she says, the, the white people are killing the colored people. Eldoris grew up in the Greenwood area of Tulsa, a buoyant, bustling community of some 10,000 African Americans. There were schools, churches, stores, theaters, and a hospital. It was a place where, for African Americans, the American dream was working. Scott Ellsworth is a Tulsa native. He's been searching for the truth of what happened here most of his life, reporting his findings in a new book, The Groundbreaking. Something happens in an elevator in an office building in downtown Tulsa between a 19-year-old shoe shiner who's African-American named Dick Rowland and a 17-year-old white elevator operator named Sarah Page. A scream from Page leads to Rowland's arrest the next day. By that evening, a lynch mob gathered outside the courthouse where Rowland was jailed. The hours go by. The lynch mob is 100, 200, 500, 800 people going. Word gets to Greenwood, and a group of black World War I veterans show up to help the sheriff defend Roland. They're turned away. As they are leaving, an elderly white man went up to a tall black vet and said, where are you going with that gun? A tussle ensues, a shot goes off, and uh, the massacre begins. The veterans retreat to Greenwood with the mob in pursuit. Gun battles erupt, but somehow it is quiet overnight until the next morning. All of a sudden, there's a, a whistle that goes off. And at that point, this white mob starts walking towards Greenwood. Eldoris and her family flee, running north up a set of railroad tracks. The crowd was just the whole breadth of the railroad track on the sides and down the middle. The residents of Greenwood try to defend their neighborhood, but they don't have a chance. The National Guard sprays the residents with machine gun fire, and it gets worse. You have something new up in the air, and its airplanes start flying over Greenwood. There is evidence, and I believe this firmly, that at least on one of the airplanes, uh, a co-pilot is dropping sticks of dynamite down on Greenwood. The airplane was up, just raining down the bullets, and I could see them, and I heard them, and I was so frightened. Greenwood is left a smoldering ruin. 9,000 people left homeless, the dead uncounted. Estimates range from 75 to 300. Eldoris lived until 2010. Her granddaughter, Joy McCondici, keeps her story alive. What did Tulsa lose by having that entire neighborhood destroyed? The glory of the bright city shining on the hill. Eldoris and other survivors gave testimony to the Tulsa Race Riot Commission, a commission that ultimately recommended reparations for the survivors. The state had a great opportunity and they turned it down. Instead, they gave each survivor a gold-plated medal. A sorry substitute for the enormous loss. Why should the sins of the father be visited upon the son? Mm -hmm. Well, I tell you why, because the, the, the wealth of the father went along with the sins of the father, and that wealth was visited upon the son. A lingering question is where the victims were buried. The commission identified three potential mass grave sites. One has yielded a dozen caskets, but there's another site never filmed before that has Scott's attention, near a homeless encampment above the Arkansas River. In 2002, a retired Tulsa police officer named Bob Patty told us about being shown a photograph showing a trench with bodies in it. You could see a steam shovel behind it. So it's our supposition that it's here. And the homeless are very much convinced that there is something evil in the canes right there. Kevin Ross is chairman of the Mass Graves investigation. Do you feel like Tulsa has come to grips with this very dark day 100 years ago? I wouldn't say grip. I think Tulsa has come to make that first step. Joy McCondici will be taking her own steps to come to terms with the past, organizing a century walk for June 1st, 
retracing the same route her grandmother took some 100 years ago. We're gonna walk a mile in their shoes as they escaped on this Midland Valley Railroad track. That's the only way I think I can um, make my grandmother proud. Those thousands that escaped off those railroad tracks were then put in the equivalent of, of internment camps for some time before they were let go again. Well, what this, a, please, go ahead. There's a million questions. Uh, well, I have a million I just, answers. What about the, the people there now, Harry? I mean, I, you know, I know in the, in the years after. There's a tiny little piece yeah. of that neighborhood left, a couple, a block and a half maybe, on two sides of the street. And the other side is all, was almost all flattened, right? There's a giant branch campus of Oklahoma State University there, mm. right? And otherwise, a lot of open territory. It's, um, you know, it's a, there's so many sins, yeah. right, that we have committed as white Americans against our black brethren. But as they go, this is as bad as it gets. Well, and it's multi-generational mm -hmm. impact. Right. It just goes on and on. When you mm -hmm. talk about a neighborhood that had so much pro just promise for her to say that was the shining mm -hmm. city on the mm -hmm. hill yeah. and to have it be destroyed and what that has wrought over the generations. I know so many white Oklahomans who of my age and even uh, you know a couple of decades younger said we never heard about never this. heard about it never never knew and about the it. reparations question is so disheartening i mean there was a chance to try to make things a little bit right a and you get a medal hand, a yes. tiny handful of survivors yes. right yeah here's your medal yeah, yeah. all right Harry, thank, thank you. you nbc news now has a documentary yes. and there's a lot of, of of documentaries that are out now okay. we invite you to go out there take a look learn what you need to learn What should we watch for to find out whether this Geneva summit was worth it? What would it take for you to support this bipartisan infrastructure deal? What are the issues that the party stands for? That seems to be the missing piece here. If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. bright. Are you ready? We're going to do our part to spread the word on the importance of vaccines, so crucial for reopening America. A big day around here, a very special naturalization ceremony. Many of them doctors, nurses, other essential workers. If you are a nurse, thank you. Spring has sprung, guys, and we want to fill this season with some fun and surprises. Yes. This is the face of excitement. <laughs> Celebrating Earth Day. Let's change the world. Love it! On the morning of April 20th, 1989, New York City awakened to the horrifying news. A Wall Street investment bank left for dead after a brutal attack while she was jogging in Central Park. A female jogger was clinging to life after being beaten and sexually assaulted in Central Park. The city was outraged. The police quickly arrested a group of teenagers, among them Yusuf Salam. Their trial gripped the city, their conviction seen by many at the time as justice served. Arrested at 15, you spend seven years in, in prison for a crime you did not commit, vilified in the public for years. But the title of the book is better, not bitter. Not even just a smidge of bitterness. I gotta tell you, I found out that a thing like forgiveness, as, as, as an example of where we can go with being able to get out of being bitter, Forgiveness is for you. It's for you to be able to surgically cut yourself from the ball and chain that is holding you back. At the beginning of the book, you, you talk about seeing the hand of God in everything yes. that happened to you. Absolutely. What do you, you mean by that? There's absolutely no way to get through any trial unless you can see the positive outlook on things. I want people to understand that it is through these kinds of trials that when you're tested, then you can testify. You have a testimony because you were able to grow through something as opposed to just go through something. 
you think part of your purpose in life was, was going to prison for a crime you didn't commit? Absolutely. I, you know, it's one of those questions where you say to yourself, if I had an opportunity to change anything, would I? But if you change anything in your past, you change everything in your future. So you do it again. You, you take the fall for a crime you didn't commit. And I wouldn't necessarily say that. Okay, okay. <laughs> Salam served nearly seven years in prison. In 2002, the convictions of the Central Park Five were vacated after a serial rapist confessed to the crime. After you were exonerated, did you still feel vilified or did oh you feel gosh. you still? Absolutely. I came out of prison in some 6'3", and I'm still walking around with my head down inside because it's still not popular to say, yes, I'm one of the Central Park Five. Why are we here? Central Park Five! Things started changing in 2012 when a documentary about the Central Park Five came out, followed by the Netflix miniseries, When They See Us, in 2019. I don't think we should admit to something that we didn't do. It really wasn't popular in a grand scale until the Central Park Five documentary came out where we got our voices back. And then, when they see us liberated us, we had no idea that we would be rebranded correctly as the Exonerated Five. The fact that his book is coming out during a time of upheaval across the country on the topic of criminal justice is not lost on Salam. Young people, when George Floyd was murdered, they said the system is not broken. It's operating exactly as it was designed. When you were sitting in that prison cell, knowing you had not committed this, this heinous crime. Is this where you thought you would be? Honestly, I, I don't think I thought I would be here. I thought I, would, I thought I would somehow get free and piece my life back together. I didn't know that when God restores what was taken from you, 100 times more than what was taken is what's given. Yusef Salam and the other members of the Central Park Five did receive a multi-million dollar settlement from the city of New York. Salam, now an author, a public speaker, even designs his own jewelry. Uh, the book, Better, Not Bitter, is out today. Uh, and let me tell you, right, that was one of those conversations where you mm. leave mm. inspired. Mm. Like, yeah. you just, you, it's, he, he put a lot of things in perspective. Uh, for me, and I think a lot of folks as well. It's not just talk either. He exudes oh, a lot yes. of grace. Lives it's, it. It's like Lives in every it. cell. Is he, is he married? Does he have a... Yes, yeah. he's, he's married, he's, he's got kids, lives down in Georgia. Right. Uh, you know, somewhat happily ever after to a certain extent, yeah. I guess you could say. But, uh, but yeah, the, the book is solid. If you can pick it up, I'd encourage you to go yeah. out. And, you found and a real purpose. Real hard yeah. earned happily yeah. ever after. Welcome to Today All Day. All Day? Today All Day. All Day. This is a long oh, way of man. asking, yeah. who's your okay. favorite character you've ever oh, played? The right. unicorn. The unicorn. You gotta have the unicorn. <laughs> What is she right there? That's why you're saying all these nice things? Yeah, she gave me the, the look. Sorry to disturb your day. Everyone's mad at you, Willie. Better make this fast. I don't want the wrath of Luna. When I see you, I always think, I wonder what his quote would be. Give us six minutes and we'll ask as many questions as we can. Welcome to Cold Cuts. Cold Cuts. Cold Cuts. Hi, buddy Cal. Cooking with me. That's no babysit. It's called parenting. What was the first book you remember loving? Heart Smart Today, with simple exercises to strengthen your heart. Make the most of your beach days. It's all about the tracksuit now. How wow. good do they look? I now pronounce you husband and wife. Kiss the bride. This morning, a story of people helping people. You've received tons of letters from people who have been inspired. Let's do the weather out. <laughs> OK. All you got to do is say, it's cold, it's warm, it's raining, it's snowing. That's it. One of our most favorite yes. franchises ever, wow. Ambush Makeovers. Okay. Look at it. It doesn't, it doesn't look so good. No, it doesn't look good. Will you okay. judge us in a cook-off? I yes. will. And okay. you guys will definitely win something. Today, all day. All day? All day. Welcome to Today, All Day. Hi, hi, hi. Big hello and happy Monday to all our friends watching our favorite streaming channel today, all day. We are so happy to be with y'all. We are here, obviously, in Tokyo. The Olympics are underway, um, and we'll be here along with some other members.